Hello, Angelica. Can we do a mic check, please? Good afternoon. Just a courtesy announcement that we are now live on the internet. Hello, Jennifer. Can we do a mic check, please? Hi, this is Jennifer. We can hear. Thanks very much. Hello, Ashley, can we do a mic check, please? Hi, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, David, can we do a mic check, please? Yep, is Dave there? We've got you, thanks. Your, your audio is dropping out just a touch. Oh, how does it sound now? That's better, thank you. All right, thanks. Hi, Valerie, can we do a mic check, please? Valerie, when you're ready, can we do a mic check, please? Yes. Hi, this is Valerie Smith. There we go. We've got you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, Gene. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. We can hear you. Thank you. You bet. Hi, Cheryl. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes. Good afternoon. Good Thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Rob. Can we do a mic check, please? Sure. Good afternoon, Dave. Good afternoon. Thank you very much.
Hi, Sherry. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes, absolutely. Good afternoon. This Good afternoon. Sherry. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, James. Can we do a mic check, please? Hi, it's James Kevin Shapiro. We can hear you. Thanks. Hello, Supervisor Chavez. Hello, Dave. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Ruby. Hello, Dr. Smith. Can we do a mic check, please? Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hello, Casey. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes, hello. Hello, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Hi, Angelica, can we do a mic check with you, please? Hi, this is Angelica. We can hear you, thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Can we do a mic check, please? Hi, Dave. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back, Supervisor Ellenberg. Can we check your mic, please? Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Hi, Julie. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very okay. much. Hi, Steve. Can we do a mic check, please? Hi, thanks. Sorry to be late. No worries. We've got you. Hi, Miguel. Can we do a mic check with you, please? Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Key. I saw you in there. Can we do a mic check, please? Once you're logged in. Looks like he's still connecting. Hello, Shannon. Can we do a mic check with you, please? Yes, this is Chennai speaking. Thank you. Hi, Marianne. Can we do a mic check, please? It always helps to unmute yourself before a mic check. It certainly does. Thanks very much. Thanks. Hi, Key. Can we do a mic check with you, please? Hey there. Hello. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to begin our Children's, Seniors, and Families Committee. And we'll um, call the meeting to order. I'm going to ask um, Dave if you can take the roll. Good afternoon, Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. I'm here. And Chairperson Chavez. Here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you. We're now going to get, go to public comment, and this is an opportunity to speak to an item that is not on the agenda, but within the purview of the committee. 
I see no hands raised, so I'm gonna go on to item four. And this is to receive a report, I'm sorry, to item three, and that's to approve our consent calendar. And our consent calendar um, is, uh, let me just see, I think that is um, our calendar and any changes to the agenda. Let me just look. And I don't have any changes to the agenda, so I don't think we need to take any action because I don't have any minutes in my packet. So we'll go on then to item four, and that is to receive a report from the Office of the County Executive and Fleets and Facilities on the Vietnamese American Service Center. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Allenberg. My name is Roberto Mendoza to provide you with a status report update on the VASC. Uh, let me share my screen. And Ro Can Roberto, while you're doing that, I do actually need an action on the consent calendar. It's the minutes and it's item 10 and 11, which is our schedule of meetings for the year. Um, without objection, can uh, Susan, do you have any concerns about the consent calendar? No. So we have no no's. That means all yeses. And we'll go to you, Robert. Robert. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So um, forward. So give you the update. Um, as of when I when I wrote this report, which was mid month. Uh, the status update was that the rough end of most of the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing was complete. The transformer installation for PGE was also complete, and a concrete pad for the trash enclosure was completed. Roberto, um, do you think we're sharing a screen, or are you doing this verbally? Um, Ma'am, I thought I was sharing a screen. Okay, sorry, no screen. Roberto, if you need help, we can talk you through it or we can, I, I believe we have it as a backup as well. Would you mind showing uh, if I can? Oh, wait, one second. Let me just, helps to hit the button. Okay. Thank you. Can anybody, everybody see the screen now? Yes. Yes. Um, so, I just went through the first three items, which were completed items as of mid-month. Um, in the next few weeks to follow, we're looking at rooftop mechanical equipment installations, um, a hoisting and installing of HVAC units on the roof. Uh, continuing with the elevator installation for the two elevators in the project. Um, establishing the points of connection for the major utilities, San Jose water, sewage, and internet service providers, establishing uh, the permanent power for PG&E, completing the ductwork and piping, uh, the build out of the trash enclosure, uh, interior partitions, doors and frames, the acoustical and hard lid ceilings, both framing and rocking. And um, last but not least, the exterior cladding, the skin, and the storefront glazing system for the building. Um, as far as community engagement, uh, the county held uh, public art unveiling and community engagement back on December 22nd, where the uh, artist commissioned to do the our, uh, public light art work um, solicited feedback from the community. So as you can see in the in the photographs, uh, we have the exterior water and air barrier now has additional layers of rigid insulation and that's going to get final with the uh, the application of uh, the metal facade, the metal paneling that goes over that. Um, as well on the lower floor, uh, we, we, we began seeing the installation of the 
metal supports that will hold up the porcelain tile. And the aluminum storefront framing has begun, as you can see on the picture on the right. Those are the uh, emollient systems for the glazing on the top floor. We have some temporary weather measures in the meantime in place at the window openings. And this latest uh, series of storms have really tested the contractor's measures in place. Uh, and both the roof membranes and the combination of mesh and plastic uh, coverings have held uh, relatively well. I was there this morning to, to see how things have been impacted and there's minor, very minor water intrusion on the slabs. The interior drywall partitions, the hollow metal door frames, those are being installed. This work progresses even during the winter months. Um, the first of the kitchen equipment, uh, the walk-in freezer has now been set in place. Um, so that picture on the left here, now we have a big walk-in freezer um, and that installation and connections will follow. So we currently track towards completion of the project while incurring a one month delay to the construction schedule. This uh, slip in the schedule was due to several factors, uh, productivity loss on the side of the contractor, but also the county and us ourselves, the administration. Uh, we implemented some changes to the plumbing infrastructure to allow for um, more convenience in shutting down uh, specific areas of the building uh, as opposed to shutting the whole place down when an emergency arises. So for that convenience and maintenance of the building, which ultimately adds a lot of value, um, we did incur some delays on the drywalling and finishing of walls interior. Um, the situation is fluid. Uh, we do continue to track other potential uh, delays to the relative to the exterior of the building, but as of date, there is nothing that is uh, different from maintaining the schedule or the scope of the work. So the schedule here now reflects a construction end date of July 15 and a move-in date uh, three months subsequent to that. And that allows for us to implement all of the furnishings, fixtures, and equipment. So that move-in date is now reflected as October 15th of 2021. As far as um, the community engagement, I beg your pardon, um, did my screen fall off? My yeah, it's got a beautiful diaper on it now, though. <laughs> uh, thank, th thank you, Windows Explorer. Um, I, I'm sorry about that. But the, let me see if I can go back to. There we are. Um, community engagement plan. I know that we had um, initially thought about winter uh, this winter, in a, it's listed as winter 2020, but should should have really said 2021. Um, and the lunar year celebration as to how we want to unveil the progress of the project, if it's going to be a hard hat tour for, you know, select members, we can definitely um, plan ahead for that. And I know that's not too far in the distant uh, future here. We have another month or so. All right, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm, let me just look to see if we have any speakers on this item. Um, seeing none, uh, Supervisor Allenberg, this, is, um, this has been a long project in the, in the coming and you know, um, we, so it's, it'll be exciting for you to get to get to see the um, end product here as it comes to fruition. 
And just um, one point of background, and that is that um, under Supervisor Cortese's leadership, probably in about 2011 and 12, there was a study done of health needs uh, for the Vietnamese community. Um, when I was running for office, there was a big interest in us um, investing in a community center, but the health, um, you know, but the, the overall, all, when I got elected, um, one of the things I took a look at was the overall health study and realized that what, what we really um, needed was an opportunity to be able to provide culturally appropriate services in, in one location. And this began um, a years long outreach process. And I, I do really want to thank the staff because this required a lot of careful community engagement to really bring the product that is going to be available to the community. Um, so one, I want to say thank you. I, th I think it's great that we just keep it on the calendar. I mean, for our monthly meetings, just so we can see um, the next phase. One thing I am really interested in is having an unveiling in the um, the May June timeframe. And um, Supervisor Ellenberg, the reason I was referring to the dates is that we've had a number of senior leaders in the community who played an incredibly important role in um, supporting our efforts that are getting older. And I wanna make sure they get a chance to experience the building. And we've actually had um, some uh, loss already of senior leaders that um, were part of the vision for this. So um, I will um, just ask the staff at our next meeting if you could come back with some strategies for an unveiling. Um, because we're not going to be able to have a majority of folks in the facility, um, you know, to its capacity, I, I think even in the fall. So just, I, I want to put that, um, ask the staff to report back on that. The second is that at the Tuesday board meeting, I made a request um, to staff to work with the, the Vietnamese American Community Service Center team who've been doing all the outreach to make sure that we're doing the appropriate outreach for services, um, particularly the nutrition program. Um, and uh, Dr. Smith and uh, Mr. Mendicacci, the, the thing I wanted to share is that we had been alerted by your staffs that um, having um, another community meeting and making sure that we had a robust list to send out the RFP could actually add uh, three months to the process. My hope is that a community meeting and um, sending the RFP out to a, a more robust community is not a 90 day delay, um, number one. And number two, I, I do just wanna point out that um, the rich um, network that we've built as part of the outreach um, for the Vietnamese Community Center, uh, I'm sorry, the Vietnamese American Service Center uh, is one that my expectation is that our, our entire organization would be collaborative relative to getting um, the information and list sharing that we have already been using. Uh, so what I'm hoping is that, um, that as part of Children's Family Seniors Committee next month, that we can get an update that is much more refined um, in terms of the timing that the RFP can go out and um, confirmation that the action we took on Tuesday will be, um, uh, incorporated into the staff's work so we do the proper level of outreach. And I'm not sure, um, Dr. Smith, if you would like this question to go to, to uh, Mr. Uh, Mendicacci or to you. Send it directly to me. All right. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Smith, um, then what I'm what I'm more specifically asking is that this, it's not a, I mean, I just will have it on for next month, but that the, that the outreach that we requested on Tuesday will in fact be incorporated and we can get a report on that next month. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Supervisor Allenberg, do you have any questions or thoughts on this item? Sorry. I don't, I, I have um, been aware and um, uh, took the time to learn about the history of this program. And I'm just, I'm really excited um, that it's so close to actually happening. And I really hear the sensitivity um, that you're expressing with regard to uh, people who may not may not live to see this and, and uh, putting some energy around trying to do that as soon as possible, I think would be incredibly meaningful to the folks that have worked so hard to get to this place. 
Thank you. So there's no action on this, um, but thank you, Roberto, and thank you to staff um, for the good uh, work and for getting us up to date. We're going to move to item five, and this is to receive a report from the Social Services Agency, Department of Aging and Adult Services related to Adult Protective Services Home Safe Pilot Program. Hi, this is Marianne Warren, the Director of the Department of Aging and Adult Services, and thank you so much for giving us the time and opportunity to present this. We have several presenters today, uh, starting with Adult Protective Services. We have Valerie Smith and Julie Aguilar. And then we have uh, from the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, Sherry Burns, Angelica Holgan, Ashley Perez, and James Byrne. And thanks again for having us. Valerie? Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. Valerie, could you speak a little more into your mic? I am so sorry. <laughs> thank you. Perfect. We can hear you um, now. Had my mic in a different place. Um, but thank you so much. Good afternoon, supervisors, uh, Chavez and Allenberg. We're so thrilled to be here today to share a little bit with you about the Home Safe program, um, which is a pilot program, uh, grant funds from the state of California that were um, introduced in 2018. And um, it was specifically designated for APS uh, programs across the state. So as you know, every county is mandated to have an adult protective services program. And um, so all 58 counties were competing for the 15 million um, one-time funds for um, the Home Safe grant for a three-year period. Um, and we were fortunate that we were able to get <laughs> a proposal off in a very short window of time. And we had great support from uh, the SSA leadership. And um, anyway, our proposal was approved. And we have been working in partnership with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, which is um, our contracted um, agency, and they will be sharing a little bit um, later on in this presentation. So just to give the background that I just did, um, the goal of the Home Safe program is to support the safety and housing stability of people that are, um, I'm sorry, thank you. Can you <laughs> stay on the slide for a second? Um, that are referred to APS for abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. And so the two populations that APS serves are elders who are um, residents of the county and ages 65 and over, and then also dependent adults who are um, residents of the county between 18 and 64 who have um, some sort of physical or other limitation that prevents them from being able to um, take care of their own needs and also to advocate in their own uh, best interest to protect themselves um, or their rights. So um, APS was designed, um, oh, sorry, you can move to the next slide, excuse me. I'm a little nervous, so I'm talking fast. <laughs> the, <Great>. so, <laughs> so APS was designed as a crisis intervention program. We do not provide long-term services. So it's it's different than um, the Department of Children and Family Services that way. All the, so our primary focus is on receiving uh, the reports of abuse through our hotline and then also um, responding, doing investigation and providing um, assessment and service plan and short-term uh, supportive services, as I mentioned before. So the research has shown that um, elders or dependent adults who lose their home to foreclosure or eviction face really difficult prospects of finding um, new housing. As you know, housing is at an all time, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, high in terms of how much it costs, but also just finding supportive um, living situations that our vulnerable APS clients uh, may need. Um, and that we know also from research that um, using uh, services and funds to, to target prevention um, saves uh, a lot of um, taxpayer dollars and also saves um, the client's dignity and respect, but also um, has better outcomes for their health. Um, and so Home Safe, um, we're proud of it because for the first time, elders and dependent adults that are APS clients um, have an access to um, homelessness services and eviction prevention services, which was the focus of our um, proposal. So next slide, please. 
so basically I already kind of went over this. Um, as many of you may know, um, when someone is entering the um, homelessness services, they um, have an assessment. It's uh, VSPDAT or the Prevention VSPDAT. Um, those are vulnerability index assessments and there's specific training and there's also um, a specific case management system that the state has um, that facilitates that. And so Silicon Valley Independent Living Center is our primary partnership. They perform those two different assessments for our APS clients who, who are home safe clients. The focus again on our proposal is eviction prevention. Um, and so some of our individuals have also received emergency temporary housing and relocation services. And then um, in our proposal, we also designated three primary referral agencies um, to APS for home safe cases. And that was um, Valley Medical Center, the County Hospital, the Sheriff's Office eviction team, and then also the Public Administrator Guardian Conservator. Um, unfortunately, our, our, our design is a little, um, uh, lacking because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but we do, we have done a lot of work with the Sheriff's Office eviction team. And so um, anyway, um, we're looking forward to sharing that with you. Next slide. And I believe this is Julie. Yes, hi. Hello, Board Sup Supervisors. My name is Julie Aguilar. I'm the APS supervisor that oversees the self-neglect unit which is the unit that receives all the home safe cases. The framework on how home safe cases are assigned is that APS receives a report alleging an elder or dependent adult abuse or neglect, including self-neglect. And the information the report must have, it has to meet the APS statewide criteria for an in-person investigation. The person has to be over the age of 65 or a dependent adult between the ages of 18 and um, 64. There has to be an abuse issue. So we have to have an abuse issue. And it has to include information about an unsafe housing or eviction. Um, they have to specify that no other housing related services are being provided so that we can avoid duplication of services. Once that criteria is met, the APS self neglect unit social workers are assigned the home safe cases. Uh, myself, I review the abuse reports for quality assurance. I assign the case to the social worker and I will notify SVILC of a new home, so, uh, home safe case. Once the case is assigned, the APS worker will review the case and create a plan for the initial visit based on timelines. This, uh, the social worker will fill out the home safe referral. It's a referral that we send out, we email to um, Silicon Valley Independent Living. Uh, SVILC supervisor will coordinate with the social worker with a plan and a time frame for a joint response. Thank you. Next slide. And I believe that's Sherry. Or no. Thank oh, go ahead. I thought it was still Julie, but that's okay. I can take it. Um, good afternoon, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellen Burke, Sherry Burns with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. Um, so uh, the uh, Home Safe Project uh, in year one, we had a target of uh, serving 50 clients. And then in year two, a slightly increase in that. Of course, that was pre, uh, pre COVID. Uh, so we have um, served six as, a, as the, end, um, uh, the end of December, we had served 63 clients total and we have 12 uh, current cases open. Um, the numbers of referrals have slowed down a bit because of COVID, but we anticipate uh, an increase in that uh, once uh, certainly the eviction moratorium um, uh, ends. Uh, the success rate is well above 90% for housing retention uh, with additional support services and case management that we're able to provide through this particular project. Um, and as Valerie indicated earlier, our focus has been eviction uh, prevention um, so that uh, folks don't become homeless. We're helping them stay in their homes and um, stay housed in a sustainable environment. Um, uh, when, I guess, as I mentioned before, when the moratorium is lifted uh, or the COVID-19 numbers decrease with more vaccinations, we expect an increase in the number of referrals uh, coming from uh, the sheriff's mitigation team, the county, and uh, Office of Supportive Housing. 
This is uh, Angela or a Angie. Hi, I'm Angie. I am the, uh, uh, my name is Angelica Hogan. I am the director of programs at Silicon Valley Independent Living Center and I oversee this home safe program. Um, our top three home safe interventions that we provide um, are payment of back rent. And that can be due to changes in household income, um, maybe a change in health condition, especially with COVID going on. Um, there's been changes in, in the family dynamics. Um, changes in support systems, relationships. Um, maybe there might have been a death in the family. Maybe um, someone has had to go into a, a higher level of care, a skilled nursing facility, something in that way where the uh, income has, they have had a loss of income. Um, we provide cleaning services um, to clients that are at risk for eviction. So we do home clean outs. Um, we um, assess for hazardous living conditions. We make a plan with the um, consumer and they kind of guide us and we, um, we assist them in getting them um, in a safe living environment. Um, we do offer temporary housing during these cleanups. Um, as well as while we are setting up a living environment after a cleanup or while they are waiting or searching for a more permanent solution. Um, what, um, part of this is the case management piece encompass all, encompasses all of these programs. And um, not only do they provide those three um, uh, top interventions, but they also provide linkage to resources, housing, um, food, clothing, shelter, other things like, like that that um, might be pertinent and uh, medical care, things like that, resources to the community that they may need. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, Sherry Burns again with SVLC. Um, then next, this slide and the next slide after this uh, depicts uh, samples of our care plan process after a home safe referral is received. The home safe team comprised again of an APS social worker and an SVLC case manager visit the resident together to assess the concerns and imminent safety issues. Each identified issue is prioritized as a priority one, two, or three, and a plan of action or intervention is created. Priority one issues are concerns that need to be addressed urgently, such as imminent abuse that's happening, threats to safety, or imminent loss of housing. For example, if someone's already received an eviction notice, then we immediately arrange for temporary housing in a motel or hotel, set them up with food, meals, and a caregiver if needed, and work to secure their personal belongings. Thankfully, often we receive enough notice from the sheriff's eviction mitigation team about a planned eviction whereby we can advocate with the landlord on behalf of the individual to rescind the planned eviction and allow our team to help the resident comply with their rental agreement terms and any safety or health concerns. Sometimes the individual has simply forgotten to pay their rent due to early dementia or a family member who was responsible for this task recently passed away or moved out, or the person has created an unsafe environment with hoarding. We work to temporarily house the person in a hotel, set them up with behavioral health counseling, and hire a hazmat cleaning crew to declutter and debug the unit. Then we move them back into their home with support services such as continued counseling, a rep payee or caregiver and cleaning services and social connections with friendly visitors or the friendship line. And sample two just shows um, other types of mitigation that occurs. Next slide, please. Okay, the um, average amount of financial assistance for a very small amount of investment uh, with uh, most of our uh, individuals and families that we're serving, uh, certainly well under $2,500 per client or family, um, has been able to secure uh, um, uh, sustainable housing and safe housing for these individuals. Uh, the range is from $50 up to a maximum that we've spent thus far around $10,000. And that is for extensive cleaning um, of a unit that was uh, heavily uh, damaged due to uh, 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 bug and, and uh, rodent infestation. Uh, the type of uh, financial or the duration of financial assistance, the average has been about 132 days, uh, a, a low range of less than a month to uh, over uh, one year, um, and the housing retention average case uh, is 69 days. Um, 
as you uh, can well understand, is that uh, uh, before Home Safe, uh, APS social services, social workers were not able to uh, maintain long um, durations of case management um, and support services for these individuals. But because of our relationship and partnership under this particular project, uh, SVLC's case managers can continue and do continue to interact and check on the individuals on a regular basis um, uh, several times a month for uh, well over a year. My name is Ashley Perez. I am a supervisor at SVILC. I'm going to be talking about a couple of our clients that we have had. Client A, um, she was referred to APS for self-neglect. She had been homeless for 20 to 30 years on and off and living in her vehicle. She is 83 years old. And when we first approached, um, she was not wanting to accept services. Um, and so because we are a long-term case management and intense case management at times, um, I went out quite a few times to try and, you know, bring her food and to develop a relationship with her just so that she can trust in what we were trying to do and trying to help her with. Um, it took me a span of eight months to kind of build that trust, to get her enrolled into our program. And then um, after that, we devised a plan with um, her safe, because she, she, was, she was at a safe park location. Um, and so the Reverend there and I had several meetings and we were able to come up with a plan of using the Medi-Cal waiver for this client so that she can go into an assisted living place in Mountain View. Um, it took quite some convincing, um, uh, but due to the relationship that I was able to build with this client, um, she trusted me. Um, we had to go to social security and we had to get into her finances. Um, and then, you know, with the help of the church as well, um, we were able to get her into the assisted living um, January of last year, ending her homelessness. Um, uh, and so she has been living there um, since January 2000. I still even call her and see how she's doing. And she wishes that I can come and visit and, and kind of uh, spend some time with her um, and just kind of check in with her because she doesn't have a lot of family. Um, but due to COVID, you know, I haven't been able to go out. I have kept in contact once a month, you know, up until, you know, this last January since the year. Um, but she is forever grateful for this program. We, with her, we were able to provide help with the enrollment pro, uh, process. We were able to get her income verification. We were able to help her buy household items, pay her first month's rent. Um, we helped her get um, her van back to um, her new place. Um, she's now currently living in assisted living where they have caregivers that will manage her medications. They will also provide two meals a day. Um, she has kind of like an apartment studio. She has a full bathroom that is um, accessible. Um, and she has a very small fridge and kind of kitchen area that she's able to cook. They have cleaning people coming in and out. Um, but this place is a long term facility to where when she does, you know, kind of go downhill, um, she is able to transition into their nursing home that's in the back of the building. And so it won't be such a huge transition for her. And that was another thing that was kind of scary for her as well. What do I do next, you know, with my life, next steps of my life? Um, and so we, I still talk to her to this day and she's like just so happy that she's out of the streets um, and is into this home. Uh, client B, um, he, she was currently in her 50s. She had refused um, service multiple times. We had to go out and kind of see her multiple times because she didn't trust some of the other programs that had failed her in her eyes. Um, and so I was able to go out, meet with her, 
um, and kind of guide her into our program. It took quite some months to kind of convince her that I wasn't going anywhere and that I was going to follow her through. Um, during this time, we realized that she was actually um, undiagnosed. She had some undiagnosed mental health issues. And um, she had actually a voucher. And so when we found out she had a voucher, we were kind of exploring apartments and, and different living situations. But due to her undiagnosis or under treated mental health um, issues, she couldn't face moving into a new home without um, getting the medical treatment that um, she needed. So what we did was we set her up with her insurance. We were able to get her in to a mental health where they ended up taking her and put, placing her in a skilled nursing facility to try and get her diagnosed and to make sure that she was medically, emotionally, physically, and able to go back into the community um, as, you know, as independently as possible. So they ended up taking her um, and they referred her to a skilled nursing facility to get um, treated. And she is actually doing really well in the nursing home. She's still there. Um, and she is grateful for the program that, um, and she still calls me saying, you're still my Keith manager, right? Even though I'm not, I still sit there and say, yes, you can call me anytime. You can definitely call me and tell me how you're doing or if you're having a rough day or a good day. So she still definitely reaches out to us too. Um, I've noticed that with a lot of our cases, they are better with long-term case management um, just because one, they're lonely um, and we see them at their lowest and we don't judge. And so they really are receptive when we see them at their highest and they're happy and they still reach out to us and we're like, keep going, you're doing great. Um, and so that has helped with the communication with our clients and overall making sure that um, our clients are successful back in the community. Julie, you wanna talk about C? Yes, so for and client- I, um, Julie, I yes. just wanted to um, say, I, I know we're, um, you're a little bit in the middle of your presentation, but I wanna ask if we could get a little closer to wrapping it up. And mostly I wanna make sure there's time for um, Supervisor Ellenberg and I to get to ask a few questions. Sure, um, do you want me to talk about this next client um, or I'll go ahead and do it really fast. What about that? So the next client was, um, the client was in their forties. Uh, they were um, referred to us for self neglect, living in the garage with no running water or kitchen and had serious health condition. He was going to dialysis three times a week, has seizures, vision loss, used to cane, had difficulties uh, with this, um, IDLs and uh, he couldn't cook. His wife was the one that would assist, but she couldn't because she was the one that was working. And because of the pandemic, she lost some of her hours. They couldn't afford to sustain the garage. They uh, were getting evicted. So with uh, the help of the Home Safe Program and SVIOC, they were able to, um, to get another uh, a place to live. They were able to uh, find a room and they were assisted with movers, a new bed, a new recliner. Um, the client then went to see his doctor. The doctor asked him, uh, you know, he was surprised by the improvement of his overall health. And when he asked uh, what was, what, how did he improve so fast? He said, because of the help of the um, Home Safe Program and SBIOC and everything that they had done for him. So that's really, I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so that's pretty much for that client, what happened. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll just speed through. This is Valerie again. I'll just speed through um, the, the next slide. This is really the reason why um, we wanted the opportunity to present to you today because um, the Home Safe Grant is ending June 30th of 2021. And um, as we've demonstrated to you, um, existing APS services are limited. Um, we're not able to provide the long-term case management that um, SVILC provided, as well as connect um, our clients with housing um, solutions. SVILC also has relationships with landlords that I know Sherry can talk about in a few minutes. Um, and then also with COVID-19, we've um, 
we've um, you know, needed to reach out to people. While there was an eviction moratorium, there were still people that were stuck in um, unsafe housing um, that we had to um, address uh, because of the immediate and long-term impacts to the population. Um, and then finally, the managed mental health needs. We, our dream would be if HomeSafe was continued to have um, some kind of partnership with mental health to have uh, or have a dedicated point person to, um, to help facilitate some of the cases like one of the ones that Ashley just described. And with that, I'll pass it on to Sherry. Thank you, Valerie. Just real quickly, we all know how expensive it is to live in Santa, in Santa Clara uh, County. And um, even though we're uh, rapidly building more ELI and PSH housing that uh, we don't have nearly enough. So thankfully, because we have been a long-term um, California community transition provider through Money Follows the Person in Santa Clara County, we've established some long-term relationships with some landlords and property managers in the area who we work with uh, pretty extensively uh, to help us place individuals into affordable um, room rental situations or sometimes even studio apartments or uh, helping us match uh, folks with uh, other uh, families um, and individuals um, who are seeking uh, uh, support for their existing housing uh, and uh, would like to have a roommate. So we utilize all of these connections in the community uh, to set people up in safe, affordable, accessible housing. And um, we also use some unconventional uh, new age resources such as room rental searches on some of the uh, social media housing sites. And we of course uh, ch check all of these out first before we make any uh, referrals to the members of our community through this project. Um, but th these are some of the ways that we have been able to help people move if they do need to move into new housing. It's more safe, uh, affordable and sustainable for them. Thanks, Sherry. I'm going to um, turn to, I'm going to ask if you, if uh, I can turn to Supervisor Ellenberg and see if she has any comments or questions. I just have a couple that I want to affirm, but we don't have any public speakers on this item. So I'm going to go to Supervisor Ellenberg and see if she has any comments or questions. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just, a, just a few one of the things that really stood out to me in your report is how critical and time intensive the trust building is. And as much as our county has worked incredibly hard um, and very largely under Supervisor Chavez's leadership to uh, prevent and end homelessness in our, in our county, we still see that the numbers are increasing faster, um, faster than we are housing people what would it take or what kind of system, what, what would a system look like to you at scale that could really build these relationships um, more than 50 people a year, but have the, the resources to be able to invest in, in what is becoming really clear is needed to actually move people into housing who have been on the streets for, as you described, um, Patient A was 20 to 30, 30 years. Is, that, is this work that is scalable when it's so personalized and so time intensive? Um, this is Valerie, uh, program manager with APS. Um, thank you for your question. I, I don't think I can speak in specifics because we've never had the opportunity to develop a program like this and actually spend the time to do the work um, that you mentioned is so needed. But we do know in APS, there's, there's um, a definite need for long-term case management for the APS population in general. Um, and so that is something, you know, that we have unfortunately been limited um, by with funding and how the state funds APS and, you know, of course, the budget constraints that we're going through right now. So I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I don't know if Marianne has um, an idea or maybe Sherry, but, um, you know, the big thing about this was APS was able to contract with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, and we have mm -hmm. almost no contracts with community-based organizations. So while this was specific to homelessness, the overall, um, you know, the umbrella of case management, it just demonstrates how much that is needed. Right. Well, that, that's true. I realize that this is the, um, just a piece of a bigger picture, but I really mm -hmm. am focusing on on the unhoused population and 
growing and understanding, not just from your report, but you really um, put a fine point on it, that we need this human relationship investment as probably nearly as much as we need physical inventory of, of spaces in which to move people. So that's, um, that's just really helpful food for thought as we think about what we fund in the county and how we really move people um, from chronic homelessness into, into long-term housing. Um, I just have a quick question about um, the hoarding and the um, and trauma. When you move somebody out, I mean, hoarding is very often a whole psychological um, mm -hmm. mental health issue and not simply just being a messy housekeeper. When you move somebody out, first of all, I'm interested to know how difficult that is for somebody to be willing to leave. And is there more tr trauma that's created when they move back into their space that then doesn't have all of the things which of course attract bugs and problems, but that provided them with safety and comfort? And how do you address that? Right, let me start. And if uh, certainly if, if uh, Ashley has anything to add because she's been intimately involved with a number of, of uh, uh, individuals that we've worked with, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, Yes, it's definitely traumatic uh, because typically this is a long-term uh, behavioral uh, component of their life and, and it's taken them a while to get to the point where their unit is unsafe and uninhabitable uh, and unhealthy for them. So um, yeah, we, we bring in um, some counseling services, our um, APS social workers and our case managers work together mm -hmm. with them to prepare them for this um, a temporary move. We try to make it as quick as possible in moving them out in the shortest period of time into a safe, nice, uh, accessible hotel room if they need uh, access features um, and support them during that process and hook them up with some uh, counseling services during this process so that if it's a few days up to a week, as long as it will take um, to bring in the um, crews for, for uh -huh. cleaning, uh, then it's, it's a sh short and an uninterrupted, you know, less interruption as possible for them in their lives. Bringing them back, it's the same kind of thing as supporting them through this um, situation. Oftentimes these individuals need a um, caregiver or um, in-home cleaning services on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So that's what we also try to hook them up with. Um, if they're eligible for IHSS, we, we help them through that application process and get them with IHSS. If not, and we're looking at a private pair pay caregiver, um, then we'll work through with them through that as well. One of the advantages with SVLC is we also have our own quick match program, which the county helped us launch a few years ago. So we have uh, over 40 private pay caregivers that w have been screened, licensed, checked, um, and that we can offer them uh, the individual to interview and hire and set them up to come in on a regular basis and help them with their their house cleaning, help them with their meal right. preparation, shopping, any of those kinds of things that they uh, may need because they just aren't capable of doing that any longer. Right. But the Thanks counseling so support I, is, is so essential as well. That's what I wanted to kind of uh, just understand the two paths. Sometimes it's just cleaning and sometimes it's a lot more. Thank you all very much for a really interesting report. Thank you. And um, I just want to um, say I, I really appreciate all of you joining us. And I want to say a very special thank you to those of you who are doing the frontline work. This is very, very challenging and very emotional and uh, really appreciate the report. I, I do have some some thoughts about how I'd like to proceed. Um, I think given that we have a, a number of other presentations that uh, I'll work, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, and just copy you on some ideas I have about the um, the the opportunity I think here with the this body of work. I will say that um, on a number of occasions, one of the issues that I've requested is that we look at our overall work in our public guardians uh, area and that we start to knit all of this together with our behavioral health teams in a in a more rigorous way countywide, because this uh, type of work is really um, very unique and it's it's embedded in social services, but its linkages to both public safety and health are ones that have um, got me asking uh, Dr. Smith and Bob whether or not 
we should be rethinking some of those services and the placement of those services that, and the, because of the connections to other uh, issues. I think um, Dr. Smith will be coming back uh, at a future meeting with some ideas around how we address that. And so I wanna make sure that we're ready, um, we're ready to do that as part of at least our budget discussions that are upcoming. So with that, thank you everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll move on to our next item. Good to see you, Sherry. It's been a while. All right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so we will go on uh, to item six, and this is to receive a report from the Office of the District Attorney uh, relating to the progress of the Child Advocacy Center. They're gonna be doing, a, a, I believe, a five-minute presentation. And in the future, uh, Supervisor Elmberg, I like to just remind people what they told us so that we have time to uh, engage them. Otherwise, we run out of time for the folks that are at the end of the agenda. Um, that being said, I will turn it over to um, James and Casey. Hi, everyone. This is James Gibbon Shapiro, and I'm sharing my screen. Um, hopefully, you can see that now. Um, looks like probably yes. Okay. Yes, we so can. Thank you. Thank you. So, I want to start off by um, uh, acknowledging something that um, I'm so glad to be here in front of all of you to be acknowledging because it's great to have Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Chavez together for this. Uh, this 20 year dream coming true for the Child Advocacy Center is because of the two of you and because of Dr. Smith and because of a series of things uh, all close in time in the spring of 2019. At the Child Abuse Symposium in the spring of 2019 when we were talking about the need for a Child Advocacy Center Supervisor Ellenberg stood up and said, I support this and I'm going to uh, vote to, uh, to make this happen. It was within a couple of weeks that Supervisor Chavez, who had convened a joint meeting for the San Jose City Council and the Children's Seniors and Family Committee on Sexual Abuse, um, expressed her personal support for the Child Advocacy Center and said, I'm gonna vote to make this happen. And it was very shortly after that that um, we met with Dr. Smith who identified the location where we were gonna make this happen. So the only reason we're having this conversation is because of the work of the three of you, and we're so grateful for that. And James, because you never sleep and don't take no for an answer, which we appreciate about you and Casey and the advocate. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, so let me um, uh, talk a little bit. Um, you know what we're co-locating, we're co-locating um, medical services and forensics, um, child interviewing and forensics, and victim services. You're very familiar with that. Um, we have, uh, I was so interested in the presentation by, about the Vietnamese Cultural Center, um, and I thought I, I would copy some of their slides in the future. So we had the design that started on this in March of 2020. Construction began in August of 2020. And I'm sorry to say um, that we've had some delays related to electrical work, data work, delivery of items, some COVID delays, and most recently some HVAC work even. And so our project completion date is now March 26th of this year. So about eight weeks away. And I'm gonna go away from my uh, slides for a minute. I've been thinking a lot about how I was gonna talk about this delay. And I just wanna start by saying I'm sorry for to uh, you and this committee that we have these delays. Um, I think that the core reason for these delays have to do with the project that we're trying to do that is a collaboration between multiple county departments, multiple city agencies, and several nonprofits. And we've um, at times in the last couple months not done well. And I'll say I haven't done well in helping to lead that coordination. So I'm sorry about that, um, but we're doing a lot to make sure that we're not here again saying there's been delays. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing about that. And I'm gonna uh, go back to sharing my screen um, now, and hopefully you can see that again. So um, the main thing that we're doing is, um, you see our team here that's on the call, Casey Halcone, Jennifer Putoff, who's the new program manager for the Child Advocacy Center. Um, we are, uh, we've become uh, more involved in every aspect of it and we're um, working better, I think, to coordinate the multiple agencies involved. And, um, and I think that's uh, really 
wonderful that the various agencies are uh, allowing that to happen, but also I think it's wonderful, especially for Casey and Jennifer uh, to be part of that. So thank you to the two of them. Um, one of the things that was a question that uh, you asked us to answer at this meeting had to do with accreditation. So we're gonna be uh, getting national accreditation for the CAC, and that's gonna be super important to secure additional grant funding for it. And I wanna take that opportunity to say, we've had some good news this week, uh, very recent good news. Um, and it was expected, but also it was good news. So as far as a year ago, um, I've been saying to uh, this committee that, uh, and to the whole board of supervisors that um, the state is giving us grant funding to fund some of the positions um, both county positions and nonprofit positions for the CAC. Uh, 2020 is a year where all sorts of things that were certain seemed precarious. So I'm glad to say that yes, the state came through and yes, uh, we learned this week that um, something we thought was guaranteed, it actually has come through. So I'm very happy about that funding coming through. Um, um, James, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, this yeah, is the, the clerk. Um, do you mind sharing your screen? You were sharing um, a different screen instead. Oh, well, I'm very sorry that I'm sharing the wrong screen. Yeah, That's and James, good. I think you got through the the points on the screen, so don't don't worry about that. Let's just we can go ahead and have a conversation about yeah. um, where we are. Yeah. So um, I'm so, uh, hopefully it wasn't something about uh, some other case, but we'll. Uh, <laughs> no, we, it was all good. <laughs> all right. Good. Excellent. So um, yes, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, done with my presentation. I want to answer all of your questions. I will uh, end by saying that um, we had a 23 members um, partner agency meeting at noon today. It was fantastic. There's so much, uh, per, uh, I'll just say love in the group uh, about working on this project and working together on this project. And it's, um, it's great to see. Um, so I'm um, I'm very happy about all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, so first of all, thank you. And and James, thanks for explaining, uh, you know, uh, the just what the challenges are. I think one thing that I would um, request that that we do, that once the, um, the center is up, that I think it would be really valuable to do a little learning of, back on and the reason is that we're going to hopefully we're going to be integrating a lot more services and i think you know frankly the fact that you're not defensive is actually really helpful to better understanding like what we did well what we learned from and what that might mean for future um programs and projects because you know a big part of what's going to move us from point a to point b is actually part of the last discussion is really that deeper collaboration that requires a lot a higher level, frankly, of leadership, which is you got to be willing to give stuff up and invest. And, you know, there's that balance of accountability and anyway, all stuff, you know, but if you could give some thought to that. Um, one thing but before we come back to you, I, I wanted to ask um, uh, Dr. Smith this question. Um, and I'm, I let me just give him a minute to see. I know he's trying to do two things at once. And I'm Jeff, back. Oh, great. Good. Okay. Thanks. I don't want to surprise you like I did last time. Um, you know, when one of the things that I had talked to uh, Dr. Smith um, about probably about two and a half years ago, three years ago, was this idea of us creating um, a diagnostic center for kids because we have so many children that uh, that we want to, that miss some of their major milestones and we wanted to make sure that we were able to connect the schools, the child, the service providers in one place. And I had had my eyes really on Valley Medical Center in part because we had the Ch Women and Children's Center there. But one of the points, Dr. Smith, that you made to me is that you had a vision um, of of O'Connor. By the way, you know even predating the, the um, more serious discussions around the um, CAC, but really taking a look at O'Connor as our, um, for lack of a better word, so the, for sort of the gathering space of where we were providing um, uh, services for, for children and young people in, in need. And one question I have about that has to do with the both the Diagnostic Center long-term and the SPARC clinic in the interim because we've got spark at the downtown clinic and i think one of the things that we're learning is that the less we're we're um moving people especially children around the more 
able we are to be able to provide um, services to them. And Dr. Smith, I was just wondering as part of the the um, expanded thinking that you've been doing about the, the healthcare system, whether or not that vision is still something that, um, that you're considering. Well, what I was thinking about, and you know, obviously we'll do what the board wants to do and, and that's that, but um, what I was thinking was um, basically deciding to make O'Connor a center of excellence for children's related issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's not obviously a children, it's hospital, but um, there are peculiar, well, not peculiar, but particular children's issues that we have in this county that are often quite well intertwined with social economic issues, criminal violence, family dynamics, and you know, um, behavioral health, uh, developmentally delayed individuals. And theoretically, um, those services are provided by numerous different agencies uh, but they're all pretty well isolated. I thought it would be much better to bring everything together on one campus and actually have the ability to um, co-consult because many of the children have multiple problems. Um, so my thought, you know, which was pretty primordial was we get CAC going and then we think about putting a diagnostic center in actually into uh, the hospital at O'Connor and start up another spark clinic. And, you know, then we have basically the anchor tenants of children's complex children's issues um, and the expertise all there to deal with it. But those are just my fantasies that we'll do what the board wants to do. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, what's exciting to me about that is that, um, you know, just uh, to share this with you, Susan, that one of the reasons I was excited about the idea is that um, one thing that's become really clear to me is that the, that the, the um, intersectionality of sometimes what's happening to the same family and, and that we're kind of pulling them in a lot of different directions to get access to services was something that I was trying to figure out how to respond to. And I think part of the reason I was so interested in a diagnostic center is that's a really interesting challenge between the, um, you know, between the schools, the medical providers, the nonprofit advocates, and the families, and then whoever else is in, involved in that. So we were really trying to think about how to simplify that. And, and one of the requests we got from the schools was an interest in um, a diagnostic center because it, because it would keep, it would in, intentionally not pit parents against the schools for resources, but really do much more of a sharing, like who's got what resource that, that the family could uh, benefit from. Uh, so anyway, we'll be getting reports on that, on that um, I hope, in the near future. But the thing that I thought was very interesting about um, Dr. Smith's um, idea was that in addition to the building that, uh, that James has done an amazing job of kind of getting everybody to, uh, to agree on is that it's actually one of the places that we have the most flexibility physically to long-term plan is the O'Connor campus. I mean, more so than we do at VMC, to be frank, because VMC is so crowded. And, and, um, and in addition, doing something longer term that, that's more um, on, a, on a smaller scale in South County at St. Louis would make some sense too, but probably starting here uh, in, uh, in San Jose at the uh, O'Connor um, facility would be a benefit. So um, on the Spark Clinic, what I'm gonna ask is that at our meeting next month, we take a look at the current um, uh, square footage that's being used at the downtown clinic and better understand what the opportunities are um, to move those uh, services over what period of time, you know, to the O'Connor site and, you know, recognizing that we want to keep all of these activities on different paths. Eventually they'll all link up, but we don't want to slow them down for now. We want to eventually link them up. And then, um, 
one thing I had asked, and I'll, uh, I will just request that staff uh, make this available to Supervisor Ellenberg, is that I had requested quite a lot of information about the the leases and the footprint of what we have at O'Connor, just so I could understand better what I was recommending and how it might work out. So we'll make sure you and your office have that so, so that when we have the discussion next month, we can kind of dive in a little bit more to the um, logistics part of it, because it's actually it's actually it's it's pretty important to this discussion as well. Um, and then the last thing, and then I'll turn it to you, Supervisor Ellenberg, that I just wanted to um, uh, to make sure of is that as we get to the next phase of the opening, I think for our next meeting, being able to dive into the um, the services that are, are going to be provided would be a benefit because again I don't I don't know that Supervisor Allenberg has had a, a presentation on it and it's been a while since I have so I think just to kind of catch us up so that as we're having the discussion about the Diagnostic Center and Spark again we can better understand where the overlap is and Dr. Smith I think what's really very interesting about having a center center of excellence for children's services um, what I think is so interesting about that is that I think that that under um, Supervisor Ellenberg's leadership as soon as she got here and I think Supervisor Cortezzi and Supervisor Yeager before her there there's been a high level of interest in terms of how we're supporting um, children and their families that have high needs um, but I think the possible partnership of a Center of Excellence for Children's Services really allows us to expand our partnerships with universities and research institutions. And I do think that um, the demographics of our community are so unique that when we reach out to other places to get ideas from them, one of the challenges we have is that we have more languages, we have newer communities. I mean, there's just a lot here that that put us in an odd position in terms of trying to grab best practices from other places only to find out that those best practices don't don't really meld here at the way that they would in another place so i think the idea of us being much more um experimental and much much more involved in creating the literature that we're reading now would be would be hugely beneficial for the children of our community so i, I really am excited about that vision uh, so anyway, I thank you all, but I'll, I'll turn to Supervisor Allenberg and I apologize for monopolizing. I want to engage you. I'm just thrilled to be on this committee. Um, that was all very exciting uh, to me. And Supervisor Chavez, when you you, you asked for something um, from James and I want to clarify what it was because it could be useful in two different ways. You, you asked him to come back with some learnings and I didn't know if you meant um, procedural learnings about how this process went or substantive learnings about what the um, Children's Advocacy Center will will offer? Uh, so two different um, requests. One okay. request is on the process because we're trying to use this, this framework all over the county. Um, and I, I think, uh, so I think it would be okay. beneficial for okay. us to be able to have access to that. And then secondly, I was hoping for our next meeting, we could just take a deep dive into the services that are being provided because we've been really focused on the logistics for a while. And I thought it might be good for us to catch each other up, but also the public. I, I think that's important. And what would be really um, further interesting uh, and to, to James is to understand the whole gamut. Um, we ha we've been talking at the full board um, for a year now about what we have done with doing away with the rake and the welcoming center and focusing on kids who are vulnerable because of unstable um, home family situations. We have the child advocacy center um, talking about potentially um, diagnostics and other pieces, but uh, having a holistic understanding of the ways in which we are, the, the big bucket ways, um, in which we are serving vulnerable kids, I think would be really helpful uh, both to see how eventually we weave all of this together. And I, I certainly love um, both uh, Supervisor Chavez and Dr. Smith's suggestions of a real center for excellence here, um, but also it will shine lights on where the gaps are. 
and what do we what do we still need to do? So I really, really appreciate your work, James, um, and your enthusiasm and your your candor and embrace of what's going well and where there's opportunity for improvement and just um, really can't wait to see this open. So thank you so much. I can't wait to invite all of you to a big party. <laughs> and Vaccinations then, uh, first. <laughs> that's right. right. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and thank you for that. And I and um, uh, Bob, I know that's something that your team will play a leadership role in, and also the Spark Clinic. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll work to structure that meeting so we can take a little bit of a dive into each of these areas. Very good. All right. Well, nothing else on that item. Um, I apologize. I did not go to public speakers, so let me do that first, and then um, we'll see if there's any other comments that folks would like to make. If I could have the clerk call on our public speaker. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Largent. I uh, kind of got onto the meeting a little late, um, just dealing with some uh, car issues and all those other fun things of being on the uh, streets in Silicon Valley. Uh, still continuing to fight for my child, um, doing Zoom visits out of a van now. Um, you know, I'll take what I can get right now, but uh, watching you people put together more things to help children is kind of a joke. Um, we divide and rule families in Santa Clara County. We don't enforce parental rights. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been coming out on the news lately. There's many documentaries that are explaining what's happening to moms and dads. And it's just really sad the way our system works here. Uh, for years, this district attorney's office would not enforce my parental rights and my child is losing out. Uh, it's very sad that I got to watch my child on visits now. Um, it's just wild how badly you have screwed my child up. And, and, and watching this, I mean, when I get done with these visits, I cry for about 20 minutes and I start to get really, really upset. Um, you know, and this is probably what a parent does um, when they watch their child hurt. And um, this is, um, it's upsetting. It's really upsetting. Okay. And I, I can't, I can't say it any other different way. You people sat back and let this shit happen to me. Okay. And I don't care if you cut me off on this public comment right now. This is ridiculous. My child deserved better. And I'll tell you something else. My ex that's raising a child by herself, she deserved better. Enforcing my parental rights would have stopped this. Okay. Out the gate, one month of not being able to see my child, I should have had counseling, access to victim services, and the Cal VCP program. Okay. What did I get? I got maliciously prosecuted by that dipshit DA Jeff Rosen. You guys are a fucking joke. That concludes our speakers. Thank you. Um, so we'll come back uh, to the board and Supervisor Ellenberg, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I don't, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, good. I, I'm hoping that um, uh, for Bob and Dr. Smith and uh, James that this was clear in terms of what, what we need uh, for next month. And, and then um, as part of that discussion, the reason I, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, we'll make sure that you get the leases that are um, part of the O'Connor uh, facility because the building that that um, this program will be inhabiting also has some leases that are coming up, which is why I want to be as opportunistic as possible and strategic as possible about what we may be able to do in the short run. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. And thanks to the public speaker as well. Thank you. Um, we will go now to item seven, and this is to receive a verbal report from the Office of the County Executive. Uh, to the office regarding the office of the children and families policy advocate. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, um, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, I'm happy to provide you an update of what's going on with the uh, Office of Family and Children's Services. Uh, right now, as we speak, um, interviews are going on for a new deputy county executive position. Uh, that person who I expect to be chosen within the next uh, week or two, depending upon how the interviews are going, will have on his or her um, portfolio the responsibility to run our 
not run, to supervise the Office of Family and Children's Services. As you remember, we set aside funding for two additional positions, which we will fill after we filled the deputy county executive position so that we have a team basically of three uh, to focus on the, the office. And I'm glad that we had the discussion about CAC and Diagnostic Center and Spark Clinic because I would envision that those are exactly the kinds of policy issues that the office will be involved with, obviously taking their lead from the board. But um, we have many services that the county provides for families and children. Those services are not always coordinated. Um, they're not always speaking to each other. They're not always uh, going in the same policy direction, um, but they're all necessary services. And we feel at the direction of the board and we agree that um, an office at the county execs level at the highest level um, of the organization will be a good opportunity to coordinate those services and put those issues and potential decision-making uh, points to the board. I imagine we'll probably come to the Children and Family Services Committee quite often. So that's all I have at this point. Questions? Yeah, so Dr. Smith, um, just uh, I just I want to clarify um, a couple things and then I'll jump right over to you, uh, Susan. Um, one is that the the deputy county exec um, position would be responsible for the Office of uh, Family and Children's Services. And I'm going to come back to that that office in just a minute. But what are the other what is the portfolio for the deputy county exec? At this time, I'm just envisioning that responsibility plus responsibility for the um, um, uh, division of equity. Sorry, having a blind no, brain don't. brain trauma. Yeah, I totally <laughs> division get it. of equity, and in with regard to the division of equity, also one of our big issues that we're trying to develop is. Um, focus on the GARE program training and structure um, in order to redefine uh, racial equity in the county government structure. And is your, um, so is your, just based on what you just said, so there would be a, a deputy county executive and then a um, somebody who oversees the division of equity and social justice and then somebody that oversees the office of children's and families services and then somebody who oversees gear and all three of them report to that single person yes and could you talk for a minute about the 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 um the, I'm, I'm not using the right words because I, to be honest with you, I never remember PM blah from PM blah. I don't, I, I apologize for that. But um, would they be the most, would they be analogous to department heads or something else? Well, we haven't decided about the positions exact, you know, which classifications would be exactly best at this point. They wouldn't be department heads, but they'd be a director executive level. So relative, I mean, relatively senior in the organization. Right. right. Okay. And, um, and part of the reason, um, Supervisor Allenberg, that I'm asking that question is that a lot of the work that I think is being done um, throughout the, the division is really excellent. That I think the challenge is that if we really want to integrate these policies broadly in the organization that we both need um, a deputy county executive who's leading that effort, but that the positions need to be senior enough in the organization that it demonstrates how seriously we're taking each of these bodies of work. And absent that, I'm not sure we're able to express that. And then the second thing is, is that I'm, I'm also looking for um, the 
the skill set and the capacity to, uh, and frankly, the gravitas to take these different issue areas and really breathe life into the into what I think is such a massive organization that absent that, you know, really being able to operationalize programming that I, you know, I think that, that, you know, that it, it won't get us where I, where I would hope we would get to be. So anyway, supervisor, thank you for indulging me and I'll turn to you. Uh, thank you. Um, th this is helpful and I'm certainly really excited about this development, but I want to get some clarification um, because the two of you um, used different terms and to me, they mean very different things. Um, Dr. Smith, you referred to the Office of Family and Children's Services. When Supervisor Chavez talks about it, she references the Children and Families Policy Advocate. Um, I don't love either of those for different reasons, but I, I want, just because the policy advocate to me feels like an extra word, uh, not important. What, what's important is that this is, <laughs> a policy um, piece and, and a coordination role. We have a Department of Family and Children's Services, and I worry that a name that's so close to that will cause confusion. Um, and I know it sounds like a little thing, but as we get further in and start to socialize the name, I wanna make sure that, that we're all on the same page, um, that this really is a, a policy office. This is a children and families um, policy place. This isn't a direct, necessarily a direct service provider, but a coordination of all of the things that are happening and making sure that we're all moving in the same direction, that we can identify gaps and we can identify redundancies. Yes, uh, probably we should work on the name, but um, I, I think we're all in agreement about the work that would be done would be coordinating services uh, across the county that the services are already provided for the most part by mem parts of the county. Obviously, there's probably some holes that need mm -hmm. to be found and filled, mm -hmm. um, but we feel that we need a effort a formalized effort to lead those services in a coordinated way to um, get the best type of coordinated wraparound services that we can have. I'm sorry I said wraparound because that's already done too. <laughs> I understand that. And, and, forget, forget that word, forget that word, <laughs> coordinated um, so that, you know, probation, uh, social services, medical, behavioral health, um, all are working together as well as, um, you know, the nonprofits and CBOs in the community that are providing right. services. And, and I see it also as infusing everything that we do the same way that everything that, that this county does should be through a lens of socioeconomic equity, of racial equity, I think it also needs to be through a children first lens. I, and I know that we've got the already on referrals or, or administration reports, we have the impact on children. Um, frankly, I think that that is treated a little bit too much as just a, a box check. Uh, and plenty of things say that they will have no impact on children um, when, that's, when that's really not the case. So I also see an educational role and, and, and I do think it fits really well with the um, Office of um, Equity and or Department, whatever that's called, Equity Division. and Social Justice. Division um, of Equity and Social Justice. Thank you, Division. Um, I, I think that this is all a good fit because it's not just a coordination of programs and services, it's an overall lens through which the county approaches our work. And if we are doing excellent comprehensive work for the very youngest residents, we are reshaping everything we do going forward. And I think that's just a, a tremendous opportunity for really cohesive, um, big, bold, exciting work. I think, um, you know, just to reflect back on the child family advocacy and policy 
um, office. Initially, and again, this was, I think, like probably in, you know, early on when we were thinking about this work. I think one of the the challenges that I um, I saw was that we were also at the initially looking for for a a voice in both within the organization but within the public to be to play that um, not just the coordinating role but really the advocate for for how we prioritize needs. Mm -hmm. I, I think just to be blunt, I'm not as emotionally attached to the name. I am far more concerned about the and so we just pulled a name. I mean, like I, you know, I in fact I named the Office of Immigrant Relations and I still say the name wrong. So <laughs> names are not as important to me as function, but and I'm sure that's for you too. But exactly. but as it relates to this, I, I do just want to reinforce um, the points that um, that Jeff raised and that you raised about the this idea that if we are if we're really doing things from an equity and justice lens, if the actions we take are really rooted in that in those um, in in that frame, that we're going to really have to your really important point different outcomes. And as a matter of fact, initially, one of the reasons we were so focused on prevention being embedded in that, we really thought of prevention being child-centered, if you think yeah. about it from the most the, the most granular way. So, but, but I think just to reaffirm the other thing that Dr. Smith raised that I think is really important, if the deputy county exec has really three leaders in each of these areas, and we're really lifting up the, the office of of um, I'm sorry, the division of uh, social justice and equity, and the and that that's equal to the work that's being done on be, on behalf of children, and that really does end up being kind of the, the locus for a lot of the prevention work, and um, the equity work is also you know on equal footing. I think we're going to be in a in a much better place. And the only thing I want to I want to raise a concern about is that. I think that one of the challenges in institutions like ours is that we we can start to think about policy as the product. And part of the reason I'm so interested in the candidates for all of these roles, including that deputy county exec role, in having the skill set to operationalize the work is that I, I think that the division of, of um, in particular the division, but I think this is true across the board, that we're really looking for uh, policies and programs that equate to a certain set of outcomes. And I'm I'm hoping that this gives Dr. Smith an opportunity to uh, really give his office the boost it needs in terms of supporting the, the product we most want to see and really being able to operationalize ideas. Because I feel like we're good at ideas. I think we have to get really you know we have to get really excellent at the implementation side um so anyway that just as a just as a, a framework of my own thinking there any susan did you want to add anything else um dr smith could you talk you talked a little bit about the timeline for the deputy county exec so i'm presuming then that the the position creation for the head of the the division of equity and the the head of the um, the GARE office and the head of the family office that those will at some point come to the board I, or do those um, do those positions already exist in the organization that you would just be borrowing them or are you going to come to the board with formal uh, requests for those positions? Uh, the board during our last budget um, authorized uh, funding for those positions so um, without naming the type of position, the funding was already set aside. So we won't need to come to the board for new positions unless we get to a point where we think it needs to be a new classification, uh, which I'm not, I'm not saying we will, but is a possibility. Um, you know, as after we pick the new deputy county executive, we'll have to have some brainstorming about exactly how we want to structure the reporting structure and you know exactly what classifications we want where because the other 
issues that we have to be cognizant of are the fact that we have a number of policy offices in the county exec's office that have sort of overlapping roles. We want to make sure we don't cause conflict or cause problems with the roles implementation. For example, you all know Office of Women's Policy. Well, how is that going to interact with the Office of Family and Children's uh, policy? Well, whatever we call it, <laughs> you know, what, what's going to be the responsibilities? The same thing with uh, the Office of uh, um, LGBTQ rights. And so we need to make sure that we have a cohesive team working in a way that they can function together, um, not overstepping, stepping on each other. Right. But if if the if each of the if the division of equity has a, a a senior manager over it without again denoting what that level is that reports directly to the county exec that and your gear or equity person reports directly to the county exec and your office of family and children's services report to the office of the county executive doesn't that mean that the division of of equity um, continues to do the amazing work it's doing, including, you know, uh, infusing policy and partnership with those senior positions. And and the reason I'm pressing on that a little bit is that it the if if the if the reporting structure is as I just described, then what it appears is that you're saying that we're going to have this division that's going to continue to do great work in collaboration with this equity office, again, that's a senior position in the organization and the Office of, of Children's um, Advocacy Policy, whatever that ultimate name is gonna be, because it, it denotes the importance of the that body of work and and presumably right. the, the bandwidth of that body of work is that, is, so I hear what you're saying that in addition to that, because I, I think that structure is actually very important, but in addition to that, that the that in partnership with who you hire, you will also take a look at how those offices will each interact with each other. Right. Mostly just from an operational perspective, you know, we have, quote, lower level positions, um, clerical positions, which, you know, individuals share responsibility. So they'll do some work for Office of Women's Policy, some work for family and children, some work for other things. And so there, there's a level of the organization where it's sort of a matrix effort because- Right, you're talking about share, sharing resources. Right, Yeah. exactly. So that's what I meant when I said we need to get the reporting structure exactly right. Yeah. And also, I think the other issue for both the equity office and the the children's um, office is that the the support necessary for those offices and the policy support necessary for those offices could could be very dynamic. Yes. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not speaking too well. I guess I had a stroke last night or something, but. Don't joke, uh, <laughs> don't joke. God, Jeff, I, please. Said that during the meeting on Tuesday too. Please yeah, stop it, yeah. Okay, I'll stop it. Anyhow, um, the, each office has its own policy work, but they also have just practical paperwork and, you know, yeah. uh, personnel work and. Administration, contract management. Stuff. Yeah, I get it. I hear what you're saying. That will be helpful. Right. Well, when we when we check in again next month, let's just have this discussion and better understand once you have that person and you've had some internal discussions, what that looks like. I think that would be really helpful. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Um, we're going to go on then to item eight, and this is a report from Bob. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm in Kuchi, Social Services Agency Director. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to talk a little bit about uh, the state budget um, as proposed by the governor uh, that uh, he put out a couple weeks ago. So 
I know uh, folks have heard um, lots about this already. Um, and I just want to touch on some of the specifics as it relates to our social services programs. Um, I think um, everybody got the kind of news flash on this that there were um, revenue estimates that uh, exceeded uh, expectations, and that was definitely some good news. And we saw some of some of that good news roll through um, into our our programs. Um, I'll just go through a few of them right now. Um, on the TANF program, uh, there was $46 million um, in additional funds uh, provided, and that was uh, specifically related to extending the 48-month 40 time clock um, uh, for, for COVID-related waivers um, as, it, uh, as it relates to uh, the 60-month the federal time clock. So it's extending, extending the state standard uh, uh, for for that, um, it was also uh, an increase in the maximum family grant, um, increasing that by 1.5 percent, and also funding to recognize um, the increase in the caseload that we've seen um, as as it relates to uh, the COVID uh, ex uh, experience in the in, in terms of caseloads going up uh, to the tune of about 11 percent uh, uh, growth. Um, on the Cal Fresh side, uh, they assumed a caseload increase of about 24%, um, which, which uh, for Cal Works and Cal Fresh is um, in alignment, uh, to in, in reasonably close alignment to what we've experienced here in the county. Um, and then they're also forecasting a 17% growth in caseload uh, for for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Um, and they also included, you know, these are statewide figures, but $182 million in additional administrative funding to, uh, to uh, push in the blow of, these, of the increased uh, caseload. Um, on the Medi-Cal side, they were assuming a 10% uh, caseload growth and um, did include some additional funding uh, for administrative uh, expenses. We're still, we've, we've been uh, wrestling with the state for years on our on our admin costs and the growth of costs and, and the state's unwillingness um, to meet those. So uh, the county welfare directors have negotiated with the HCS to at least carry forward whatever that California consumer uh, price index uh, uh, standard is for each year. And they did honor that in this upcoming budget so that those funds are in there. It has not kept breath uh, pace with the cost of administering the program, but at least it is, is something and that will continue into the next uh, the next fiscal year. Um, on the child welfare side, there's a couple uh, couple areas of increased funding, about 61 million for COVID related supports. There's a variety of different supports that have been some um, incre increased in uh, is funding availability uh, on the state and federal side as it relates to the program. Um, there's $10 million in um, additional funds for workforce development. And there's also some acknowledgement of um, some increased costs on the placement side as it's going to relate to the Families First uh, Prevention Services Act uh, uh, as, uh, as it relates to changes in, in the structure of, of funding there. On the adult uh, and aging side, um, they uh, carried forward a delay in the IHSS 7% uh, service reduction. It's been proposed for some time and each year they've uh, held that off and they're holding it off until 2022 um, uh, in, in light of, of COVID um, impacts and such. There's, um, there's a little over $5 million provided for uh, increased uh, funding for, uh, for some technology uh, improvements uh, to help with some of the, some of the COVID related uh, challenges that the systems have faced. Um, there's uh, $5 million uh, uh, put in place for uh, some of the aging master plan um, activities. So this is from the planning side. And again, we're very excited about that. As you heard earlier, you know, there's some things that we're very excited about in terms of increased focus on this population, but also the ability to potentially uh, see growth in this area around providing much better level of services, uh, like, on, like on the APS side, as our staff mentioned. Um, their their desire to do and uh, the, the the lack of uh, funding in the past for that. So we're excited to see the uh, aging master plan move forward with some funding behind it on the planning side. Um, 
and there's also uh, uh, 250 million dollars across the state provided for um, some uh, senior housing uh, preservation act uh, actions uh, to help on the, the housing crisis for for this population. Um, there's also on the safety net side about 30 million dollars for food programs. You know, again related to a lot of uh, uh, the COVID related activities and such, and a lot of like what we've done in our county. So it's good to see. Um, these uh, these funding sources uh, made made available um, broadly on uh, one of our main funding sources as it relates to all of this is the realignment funding. Uh, we get a good chunk of our funding out of the sales tax portion of that. And again, there was some good news in the sense that they expected a, a very dramatic reduction in sales tax revenues uh, this current fiscal year. And um, the revenues are, are actually, you know, pretty much on par with uh, where we were in the past. And they're only forecasting about a 2% reduction versus uh, something that was close to about 20% reduction uh, when we were going into this fiscal year. So a lot of good news on, on that front in terms of at least maintaining what we have. Um, still, there are gaps and there will be challenges, but uh, there's definitely, definitely some good news um, uh, underlying uh, underlying all the, the, the strain and increases in caseload that we have seen. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions around uh, this or any anything else. So Bob, to be honest with you, I'm not used to you giving that report and saying we're getting more money. So I, I'm usually usually like, why are they doing this to us? But um, but uh, let me turn to Supervisor Ellenberg first and then I just have a, one quick question. Go ahead. Thanks so much. I, I just have a, a, a request. I, in um, it's about the overlapping eligibility of Medi-Cal and CalFresh. In the January um, public health written report to HHC, there was uh, an interesting stat um, that says in July 2020, there were 395, 449,000 Medi-Cal eligible county residents and 99,509 individuals who participated in CalFresh benefits that month. So that's just about 25% of people who should be eligible for CalFresh actually applying uh, for it. And the, the same report also indicates that the USDA data shows that every dollar in CalFresh benefits generates $1.79 in economic activity. So what I'm interested in is given that SSA coordinates enrollment for both CalFresh and Medi-Cal for our county residents. I'd like to request an off-agenda report that outlines what steps SSA takes to assure crossover enrollment of individuals in each of these two obviously critical safety net programs so, so that we know that we are maximizing the enrollment uh, in California, uh, in our county in CalFresh. Yeah, we'd be happy to. Our, our our teams are always looking at that, and we definitely um, have uh, some activity uh, currently underway around doing some investigation. Do you have a, a sense offhand? I didn't want to, you know, pop a very big question um, with, with no notice in advance. But it, it, right. just if, if there are any quick observations that you could share as to why the CalFresh enrollment is so much lower than the Medi-Cal, I would be interested. And if not, I'm happy to wait for the report. Yeah, there is there is not a, a direct one for one correlation um, in terms of the eligibility. So that's one piece of it. The, the Medi-Cal population is a broader eligibility spectrum, but still, um, in terms of penetration rates, um, we do not have 100% in our county for CalFresh. We've, we've CalFresh. We've long known that. The state has also long known this. This is something across all of California. Um, so there's a variety of factors. Some of it is personal choice and people for a variety of different reasons, which we can provide in the report, um, do not choose to, to, to accept uh, CalFresh benefits. But also one issue that we've been looking at statewide as part of um, a response to the Fed's uh, pressure on the state to improve our numbers um, in, in general um, relates to how... Uh, I mean, the main, the bottom line with this is this program is highly scrutinized, and what you don't want to do is have a high error rate, you know, where you where you are inappropriately giving out benefits. And if you do, you end up owing a lot back to to the federal federal government. So the state had taken a pretty hard line about how it approaches that, and where other states have been much more generous on uh, what you have to report, like changes in circumstances, changes in your income, things like that. 
states that do very well with enrollment and that also have um, uh, easier, laxer uh, standards around that. So there's a lot of conversation at the state level around things that we can do in the program to help um, help keep folks in the program and help uh, help with the 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 uh, improving the the eligibility rates. But we'll be right, happy to have of course the, the flip side of being worried about having to give money back is that we're leaving so much money um, on the table that could and should be helping our local residents and our local economy. So I'll, I'll look forward to seeing that. Absolutely true. And that's what we're trying to convince the state of too. So, so right. Thanks, Bob. I know that. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing um, that I would also say is that perhaps that's uh, worth a discussion, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, on the on the committee, because I, I think the, the other thing that we should revisit um, and I see that Dr. Smith isn't with us anymore, but I, I'm not, I don't want to surprise him with this, but I'll just say this because I can see Miguel and Key on. I do think that we need to have a deeper dive into how we're going to be managing food over the next six months to a year. So to me, this la layers in nicely to a bigger discussion around food and perhaps we can use the report back, agendize it with a uh, with also just the expenditure plan that we already have in place with our partner organizations to provide food meals on wheels and all that and that way we can just have a kind of a, a bigger discussion about how the who what the funding sources are going to be for us to be able to continue to provide meals and we have we pardon me had a report out at the board of soups about it but the but the truth is that a lot of the networks that we had in place are really being strained right now as time is moving on and it might be a good time to check in on that overall discussion. The other thing, um, Supervisor Allenberg, that I'll share with you that I've raised a number of at a number of times, and I think I've brought this to the board too, is that I'm really looking at the size of the food benefit for exactly the reason you raised about both the economic implications of it, but also um, with schools being so strained right now, it's hard for me to understand why we're not pivoting. I mean, I understand it from a financial financial perspective, and I think uh, Bob and his, his team have made that clear, but I also think this is an opportunity for us statewide to really look at our state and federal partners to to finally adjust the rates uh, that we're, you know, that are, that are being paid. Oh, sure. I mean, it's a horrible, notorious social justice challenge to see how you, you know, subsist on a, on a week of of just um, EBT or food stamps and the, the categorical message is always, it's just not enough. Right, and so, yeah, so, I, and Bob, I, I would leave that up to you and your team to figure out how to shape that discussion, but I appreciate that we've been having it in pieces. It might be easier for you to have it in one, one fell swoop. Sure, sure thing. Yeah, good, thank you. All right, so we'll now go on to Mr. Guerrero. Good afternoon. Uh, my report is uh, going to focus primarily on budget and uh, briefly going to talk about a current year budget update and also an update for uh, FY22 for next budget year. Uh, for current budget year, I have some good news. Um, the way that the California Department of Child Support Services funds each county child support office, it's on a year to year basis um, and we're not allowed to roll over any unspent funds uh, from one year to the next. So the upside of that for a county like Santa Clara is um, we had some significant cuts and obviously had some deficits we had to close. Uh, but because other county child support offices in the state are not fully utilizing all of the allocation that they were um, given for the current year, there's some year end money available to reallocate and redistribute across the state. And so I've been in uh, discussion with the state about that and we've had multiple meetings on that. And I'm happy to report that we're getting a one-time um, augmentation for current year of $500,000 from the California Department of Child Support Services. Uh, with along, um, along with our other cost-cutting measures will allow us to reconcile um, the deficit that we had going into this year because of the 14% cut we received from the governor's May revise last year. So that's good news. And Congratulations. so- Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. We're, very excited about that. Uh, we were hoping that that would come through towards year end. And uh, now that they finished halfway through the fiscal year, they had projections from other counties to let them know how much they were gonna spend and how much they were gonna have left over. So, 
So that's one item on current year, and that's good news. Uh, item number two, which relates to next fiscal year, uh, just like Bob mentioned, uh, the state released the budget for the California Child Support Program. Uh, there is an augmentation of about $25 million there. It's going to the 19 most needy child support offices based on a staffing ratio, which was previously uh, determined between the state and the Child Support Directors Association. I have mentioned it before, it's that 188 cases to FTE ratio. Um, because we're not there yet, we're still working on getting to that ratio. We're not eligible to receive any of that funding. But on the upside, we're not getting cut at all. And so next year, we continue to uh, be able to make do with our allocation. We don't have any additional funding reductions and no cuts. So that was welcome news, especially after receiving a 14% reduction current year. So we're hoping that uh, over the next 12 to 18 months that we use that opportunity operationally to stabilize the fact that we've had such a significant reduction in staffing. Uh, by the time the board uh, reviews the mid-year budget, um, I think coming up February 9th, I think it is, um, we would have then by then cut almost 50 positions in our department, which is a significant number. Um, so we're going to be spending the next 18 months uh, readjusting, restructuring, reorganizing, and uh, putting other uh, types of strategies into place to allow us to be more efficient and effective with a reduced number of staff. So um, I'm going to take it as good news that they're not cutting us for next year, and we're going to be focusing on how do we make do with what we have. Um, and also, obviously, the receipt of one-time funding for current year is good news. So um, even though we're not getting any additional funding, uh, we're not being cut. And given the dynamics and the, the current state of, of funding for a variety of state departments, I think that's good news also. Uh, so those were the two items that I had to report on, both budget related, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg, do you have any questions? Um, Ignacio, I just had one comment uh, or request actually that I wanted to, to see if the, um, to just better understand how the association could respond to this. You know, we we just took a vote a, a couple, maybe about a month ago to add $6 million into a statewide um, fund for loans. And one of the, the loan dis, um, caveats is that if you are somebody who owes child support that you don't have access to the loan. And I know that we've been trying to do some reforms around that because we obviously need people to make money in order to pay their child support. And I think there have been some reforms around not withholding licenses or you know any anything else. But um, this was through the, I believe it was through the through. Uh, Susan, I'm sorry, I can't remember what's the name of the loan fund for the small business program. California Rebuilding Fund. Yeah, California Rebuilding Fund. And and so I, I would just hope that you all could take a look at that because I think as we're looking at stimulus, we should be really, I mean, I think there would be a more proactive thing to say, which is that if you owe child support as you're getting money, that some portion of it, I don't know what the right way to do it is, but I, I think, I thought we were moving away from um, keeping people from making money. So I just wanted to raise that with you. And the California Rebuilding Fund, like I said, it's a partnership, I think, with the State Infrastructure Bank, which is why I was surprised about the, you know, not allowing people. So anyway, if you, if you wouldn't mind just taking a look at that and seeing if there's some sort of letter or something that you could write as it relates to the reform approach we're taking. Yeah, well, we'll definitely take a look at that. And just to speak to your point, um, the first round of stimulus funding um, Congress wrote in specifically that, that uh, those stimulus checks be used to uh, pay any back due child support through an intercept program. Uh, however, this next round, uh, what we're being told by the federal government is that won't happen so that more money gets to families to help balance out that need, obviously, with the economic impact due to the global pandemic. Um, the other thing that's happening is we have temporary suspension on some enforcement mechanisms because of the global pandemic and because unemployment is so high. So we are working with folks as best as possible given the unique situation that we're in. And we'll definitely follow up on that item and see what we can do. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, the last thing is, and thanks very much. Uh, the last thing is our, we're gonna adjourn our meeting. I did wanna just um, ask uh, both Key and Miguel that for our next meeting, I would like a report out on the hub and where we are um, in process. I, I think that program is almost a year behind schedule. And I, 
I want to get um, an update on where we are in the process and what are the key next milestones so that we can get it back on track. Um, so thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Amy. Have a good one. You too.